Hello and welcome to Real Cheating Story. Doug nursed a drink and stared at the lazy Texas sunset. Man, I'm going to miss this. I ain't going to miss the summer heat, but there's something about standing in your backyard wearing only shorts and a t-shirt in November that I could have gotten used to. Oh, and the smell of Texas barbecue, damn, my mouth is already watering. Turning, he glanced back at the family cookout in progress behind him. The get-together was in his honor, celebrating his recent promotion as shop foreman. It was labeled an adult party, and the half-dozen company employees and their spouses were there without any children. Doug was thankful for that because he had every intention of turning this into his farewell party. When he got the chance, Doug went out to his truck and picked up what he figured he'd need for a visual aid. He suspected they'd ask him to give some kind of speech, and he wanted to make it memorable. He discreetly slipped his Glock 9mm into the back of his jeans, making sure it wasn't noticeable under his dinner jacket. As he made his way back through the guests, he saw his boss coming towards him. Tommy Peterson was a large man with a smile that could light up half of Dallas. Even in his fifties, Tommy had a presence that both demanded respect and put you at ease. Beside him walked his wife, Martha, who was more than a little on the heavy side but still decent looking for her age. She had a charming personality that drew people to her and made her a maternal figure to almost everyone. The problem was that Martha seemed to have a knack for trying to set Doug up with women. Since he'd moved to Texas 11 months ago, she had been relentless in her mission to find him the perfect partner, despite his clear disinterest in dating. Doug was still trying to get over his first marriage, and Martha's attempts only made things worse. If he'd been more vocal about his feelings, maybe she would have taken the hint, but he preferred to stay quiet, polite, and private. Sitting with Martha and several of the other wives was a woman who, in their eyes, was the perfect match for Doug. She was beautiful, with long blonde hair and a very pretty face. Of course, she always looked great because she worked in a beauty salon. Doug had to give them credit. She might have been the perfect girl for him a couple of years ago, but now she was his ex-wife, Teresa. The fact that they knew this and still pushed her on him was what really burned him. He hadn't shared the details of his divorce with them, as it was none of their business. He had clearly stated his disinterest in dating or even being near Teresa, but there she was, surrounded by women who were pleased with themselves for getting him and his ex-wife face to face. Teresa had likely downplayed the reasons for their separation, painting herself as a repentant wife who made a mistake and was trying to reconcile. Tommy stood up, addressed the group, and finally introduced Doug. Showtime, Tommy said with a grin. I'd like to thank y'all for coming out tonight. I know this was supposed to be a celebration, and I guess it is in a way. Tommy offered me the job as shop foreman, and I want to thank him for that, but I'm going to have to turn it down because, as of today, I'm resigning. Sorry to spring this on you, and I'll understand if you don't want to give me a good reference, but I'll be gone tomorrow no matter what happens. Doug watched the startled faces as Tommy opened his mouth to say something. Doug, this is a party in my home, Tommy said sternly. No disrespect, sir, Doug replied. You've been more than fair with me, and I owe you an explanation, but there are others here I sure as hell don't owe anything to. Martha, Doug said coldly, I think you and the rest of your little group have done more than enough to me. I've made it very clear I didn't want to date anyone, and I sure as hell made it clear I didn't want to be anywhere near my ex-wife. Apparently, what I want isn't important, so I'm either going to speak now or leave for good. Your choice, either one sounds pretty good to me right now. The group fell silent, except for the sound of Teresa crying. All right then, I'll tell you a little story. Teresa looked up at Doug and slowly shook her head, her eyes pleading with him to stop. You see, about two years ago, I left my small hometown in Georgia for the first time in my life. I left behind a broken marriage and a family who had turned their backs on me. I came here 11 months ago, trying to start anew, but it seems I can't escape my past. It just keeps finding me with the help of others. Doug glared at Martha until she looked away. I married my high school sweetheart five years ago. She was everything I ever wanted or dreamed of. 
We got married after she graduated, and for three years, I thought we had the perfect marriage. She worked in a beauty salon, and I worked in one of my family's garages. My dad owns several garages across northern Georgia, so that's where I learned to be a mechanic. But just like the Garden of Eden had a serpent, so did my marriage. Unfortunately, my serpent turned out to be my kid brother, Billy. Billy is three years younger than me but has always been the center of attention in my family. He's supposedly a recovering illegal substances addict and has been since he was 15 when he dropped out of school. My parents have always looked out for him, sacrificing themselves and me for whatever was best for Billy. I heard Doug, we have to help him, he's sick more times than I can count. So, three years ago, when I heard he'd been evicted from his latest place, I wasn't surprised. My family, including my wife, wanted him to stay with us until he could get admitted into another rehab. My response wasn't just no, but hell no. Both my wife and my parents were shocked and appalled that I could be so cold and turn my back on my brother. In my mind, I wasn't turning my back on him, I just wasn't enabling him. Over the next few weeks, they made my life a living hell, pressuring me until I agreed to let Billy come and stay. And my reward for trying to be a good big brother? Doug glared at his ex-wife, trying to calm himself. I'm not sure what Billy told my wife to get her to have an affair with him, but it worked. Of course, neither of them ever bothered to tell me about it. Two months later, I got the news, honey, I'm pregnant. Like a fool, I was thrilled since we had been trying to have a child for the past year. Imagine my surprise a few months later when the doctor told us there was something wrong with the baby, a heart defect common in children of women who used cocaine. My wife, of course, denied ever using illegal substances. Then the doctor said something that turned my world upside down. He mentioned studies suggesting that illegal substances abuse might not have to come from the mother, and that illegal substances used by a father could cause birth defects. I started getting angry. When I told the doctor I hadn't been using illegal substances, he said birth defects were still a mystery, and there must be another reason. My wife, the one I trusted more than anyone, told me I was the child's father. But things weren't adding up. When the baby was born, the surgery was considered a success, but I wasn't naive. I had a DNA test run, and when the results came back, it was final, I was an uncle. I lost it. I threw all of my wife's things out of the house, grabbed my Glock, and went looking for the brother I once called family. I looked everywhere but couldn't find him. My parents had sent him to some out-of-state rehab. It turns out, my brother waited a whole week before telling them about his affair with me. Then the four of them sat on their hands, hoping I would never find out their secret. I filed for divorce the next day. As soon as my ex-wife was served, the non-stop complaints from her and my parents began. I couldn't stand to look at her or even hear her voice. I was in shock, all my dreams were shattered. I'd been betrayed and lied to by those who claimed to love me. After a week of relentless pressure from my parents, I agreed to talk to her. I heard all her excuses, she said Billy was depressed and had nothing to live for, she felt sorry for him and was only trying to comfort him. She claimed it was just a mistake that went too far and didn't mean anything. She said that the second time she was with him, she restored his will to live. Seems my ex-wife was trying to earn some sort of sainthood, one misguided action at a time. I can only wonder if she's been spreading her kindness elsewhere. I spat out the bitterness that was building in my mouth. Teresa sat there and quietly cried. Both Teresa and my parents weren't alone in their efforts they recruited others to talk to me. My favorite was when the pastor of the church my family had attended for generations paid me a visit. My family was heavily involved in church funding and had supported several of their building projects. He went on and on about forgiveness. After a bit, I grew tired of it and agreed to forgive, but with two conditions. First, he would preach a sermon on the topic of betrayal involving close family. Second, the following Sunday, I would get to stand before the entire congregation and give my testimony before I publicly forgave them. I smiled as I remembered his reaction. I never heard from him again. Of course, 
My parents kept insisting. They told me I needed to be a bigger man. They said Teresa had made a mistake but her heart was good, that my wife and baby needed me, and a real man wouldn't abandon them. They went on and on about how they had raised me better. My dad finally told me how disappointed he was in me for not forgiving Teresa and Billy. I told them both how disappointed I was in them as parents. After that, I let them have it and told them exactly what I thought of them. It was very ugly. Finally, when they asked me if I'd read my brother's apology letter and suggested that I shouldn't blame Billy because he was sick, I lost it again. I told them I had discarded his letter. I also told them to never mention my brother's name to me ever again. They didn't believe me, so I decided to show them. I stared at my audience, making sure I had their full attention. Reaching behind me, I pulled out my Glock. There were several gasps and more than a few expletives. I was grateful I was at Tommy and Martha's house. Usually, pulling a gun in Texas could get you into serious trouble, but I knew Martha had banned any guns from being brought into her home, so I was the only one armed. I lowered my voice to a menacing growl and continued, I see you had the same reaction as my parents. I remember telling them, you mention that name to me one more time and I will hunt him down and put a bullet in his head. I swear to God, you will be burying your favorite son within the week. I paused to watch the color drain from several faces. I'd made my point. Apparently, my parents believed me, as they haven't spoken to me since that day. Too bad I can't say the same for my ex-wife. I figured I might actually hurt someone if I stayed any longer, so I moved across the state line to Alabama to wait out my divorce. I left Teresa and the child with everything but a few dollars I needed to start over. I guess I should be grateful it took her six months to find me. I heard she had some kind of breakdown and had to be hospitalized. It seems she tried to harm herself but failed. It was kind of like her attempt to stay faithful, close, but no cigar. I stared at Teresa as she buried her face in her hands, her shoulders heaving as she sobbed. I'd like to tell you I felt sorry for her, but I didn't. She had made me what I am now by tearing out my heart. All that was left was the pain from my past and a rage I have to fight to control every day. Over the past two years, I found I couldn't move on. The fact that Teresa kept pursuing me didn't help. She always said we were soulmates destined to be together. I thought it was kind of silly, like she'd read it somewhere and just liked the sound of it. I have my doubts now. I've never felt so alone, like a part of me is missing. I find myself looking beside me, wanting to ask her what she thinks. At times, I've even reached out for her hand, but it's never there. I can feel my heart growing colder and the anger intensifying each time it happens. Before this, she had always been there for me. I remembered my graduation. My dad wasn't there because Billy had gotten into trouble again. Dad had gone down to the police station to pick him up and talk with a magistrate. My mom was so worried she was a basket case, so I told her to just go and join dad. My graduation party included my friends and some family members, but none of my immediate family. I tried to hide my disappointment, but Teresa saw through it right away. She made sure I felt love that night, several times. It really had been my special night. I woke up in the middle of the night after my party, lying in my bed with Teresa beside me. I noticed my parents standing in the doorway, staring at us. Slowly, I got up, put on my boxers, and walked over to the bedroom door. My dad wanted to say something about Teresa being there but thought better of it. My mom had tears in her eyes. They both whispered their apologies for missing my party. I lied and told them it wasn't a big deal. I remember telling them I'd be moving out soon and staying with my cousin until Teresa and I could get married. Then I shut the door in their faces. My attention was drawn back to my audience when a couple started to stand up. I cleared my throat and shook my head. They quickly sat back down. Carefully, I put my Glock down beside me and you could hear the collective sigh of relief. I looked at them and continued my story. When she finally found me, she moved into the same trailer park I was living in. 
I had already obtained a restraining order against her and filed about a dozen more complaints. I knew I needed to move again. The divorce had finally come through, so I packed up and moved to Texas. She didn't mention the restraining order to you when she gave you her story about our marriage, did she, Martha? Martha, now starting to cry, shook her head. Didn't think so. She's pretty good at leaving out important details. When I arrived in Texas, I was fortunate to find someone like Tommy, who helped me start over. He gave me the chance to prove myself and didn't pry into my past. I made it clear that I didn't want to talk about my past, and after confirming I wasn't running from the law, he was okay with that. Unfortunately, his wife didn't respect my wishes. I hadn't told anyone where I was moving, not even a few friends I still had in Georgia, so imagine my surprise when three months ago, my ex-wife moved into town. An even bigger shock was when Tommy's wife decided to try to get me and my ex-wife back together. Martha started to speak, but I interrupted her. You had your chance, but you sure as hell never listened. Now it's my turn, I said with enough intensity to silence her. I've made it clear many times over the past year that I didn't want to date, didn't want to discuss my past, and definitely didn't want to get back with my wife. Apparently, what I want doesn't matter. Martha sobbed, Doug, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. I cut her off. Didn't know? Since when do you need to know the details before respecting someone's privacy? Who do you think you are, that someone has to explain things to you before you'll stay out of their life? I could tell my words had hit their mark. It was time to end this encounter. So, Martha, I want to thank you and the others for making my last two months a living hell. I would wish you well, but that would be a lie. Personally, I hope you all turn on each other and make each other's lives miserable. I looked down and saw Teresa's tear-streaked face. Please. Baby, please, she begged. Please give me another chance. I told you to get away from me, Teresa. Go home to your child. I can't unless I bring his father back with me. You want to find the kid's father? Go look in some rehab or a gutter. If you were referring to me, it's never going to happen. If you haven't been following our story, I am definitely not the kid's father. I picked up my Glock put it back in my belt, and turned to walk through the crowd, which parted quickly. I heard several apologies and noticed a few people looked me in the eye. As I reached the driveway, I heard Teresa scream behind me, Doug, wait. Please don't go. I can't live without you. Doug, she screamed as she fell to the ground, weeping. You have to come home. You just have to. I turned around and looked at her. Listen, Teresa, I don't care if you take drastic measures or not. Just stay away from me. I saw everyone staring at me, realizing that I still couldn't get anyone to listen. I snarled and walked to my truck. Now, let's listen to the story from Teresa's perspective. The doctors say recording my thoughts is good therapy and will help me discover myself. Personally, I think they're mistaken. They don't seem to understand that I've lost my anchor, my soulmate, my best friend, and until recently, my husband. I lost him because of one stupid mistake that he can't forgive me for. To understand us, you need to know our past. Doug and I started dating in high school. He was a sophomore, and I was a freshman. I knew I loved him from the moment we first kissed. We went through high school together, and I knew we would end up getting married. Three months after I graduated, we had our wedding. I'm sure my parents were thrilled, first, because I was out of their house, and second, because we didn't have to get married prematurely, as good little Southern Baptists. My parents and I were always arguing. They loved Doug but didn't approve of my lifestyle. They thought the drinking and partying were too much, but they knew I'd never do that with anyone but Doug. He was everything I'd ever wanted. He's always been who I thought was my soulmate, even when I made mistakes. It had nothing to do with my love for him. Although he doesn't see it that way, all he sees is the betrayal. He doesn't understand that when I see how much he's hurting, I'm hurting too. 
Doug has always been my rock. Whenever I lost control, he was there, until now. Most people think he's shy and quiet, but I know better. What he really is, is a volcano. He's calm on the outside, but inside, it builds up until he explodes. I've seen it happen several times, but rarely in public. One time, it happened in front of a bunch of our classmates. We had gone to a keg party, and while we were drinking, this jerk, Jerry Whitmore, grabbed my rear. I turned around and slapped him. Then the drunk guy grabbed me and tried to touch me inappropriately. He must have had a death wish to act up in front of Doug. Even though Doug isn't the biggest guy, he's strong and in excellent shape. Jerry didn't even get a punch in before Doug had him on the ground, sitting on him and pounding his face. It took three guys to pull Doug off him, and when they did, there was blood everywhere. Doug really did a number on him, and there was talk of charging Doug, but then I threatened to file assault charges against Jerry, and everything was dropped. After that, I never had any more issues with other guys. Doug and I got married right after I graduated. It was one of the happiest times I can remember. He was already working as a mechanic in one of his father's garages, and I went to beauty school. Soon, we had enough saved to buy our first house. It wasn't much, just a little two-bedroom house, but it was ours. The first two years were tight financially, but we had each other, and that was more than enough. I felt like I was living in a fairy tale. Doug and I didn't have a perfect marriage, but it felt that way sometimes. We would argue, but then I'd apologize or cry, and he would give in. I didn't do that very often, I didn't want to take advantage of Doug. Our love felt like a protective wall around us, keeping us safe from the outside world. I guess that's why I didn't see the danger until it was too late. When Billy was evicted from his trailer, our problems started. He had no place to stay since he was arguing with our parents. They didn't want him staying with them again so soon, but they didn't want him on the street either. They asked us if he could stay with us for a few weeks until they could get him into another rehab center. I said okay, but Doug said no. I knew Doug had a lot of issues with his family, most of which were justified. His parents, Tom and Paula, were decent people who had a son who was a mess, which tore their family apart and affected ours as well. Billy was always the loud one, the one who'd do almost anything on a dare, while Doug was the quiet force, always in the background but ever-present. Together, they were a team until high school when Doug started hanging around his friends and football teammates more. Billy reacted by becoming even more of an attention seeker and rebel. It was no surprise when Billy started hanging around with people using illegal substances. By the time Billy was a freshman, he was already deep into addiction, which caused significant damage to the family. He dropped out of school the same year Doug graduated. Doug's parents tried everything, sweet-talking, bribing, threatening, and finally tough love. Billy used that as an excuse to drop out of school, and Tom and Paula ended up caving to him on almost everything, leaving Doug to fend for himself most of the time. I knew that hurt Doug deeply. Billy was set on destroying his life, and it's a shame because he could have been something special. Doug is a good-looking guy, but everyone agreed Billy would have been better looking as he grew up. Unfortunately, the illegal substance's addiction changed that. Doug tried many times to reach out to Billy, but Billy responded by stealing from his brother and their parents to buy more illegal substances. When Billy turned 18, Doug stopped trying. We had been married about two and a half years when Billy was evicted. Tom, Paula, and I were persistent in trying to get Doug to change his mind. Tom and Paula felt out of options and needed to ease their guilt. They didn't want Billy to come back and live with them again after he had stolen a lot of money from them just a few months earlier. I wanted Doug to reconsider because you can't just turn your back on family, and it was getting close to Christmas. It would have been a terrible holiday with Billy living on the street. A few days after Christmas, I let my fairy tale marriage come crashing down. Doug had called to tell me he was working on a car transmission for a middle-aged single mother of three in town. It was her only car, so he and another mechanic were going to work through the night to fix it. 
I got home late from the beauty salon that night, and as soon as I walked into the house, the smell of smoke from Billy's marijuana hit me hard. I pounded on the bedroom door, but he didn't answer. Frustrated, I opened some windows and then took a shower. After my shower, I got ready for bed. The smell of smoke was still strong, but I needed to shut the windows because it was cold outside. After closing the windows, I went back to Billy's door and knocked again. This time, he answered, and the look on his face scared me. His eyes were red, and it was hard to tell if it was from the smoke or if he had been crying. He looked deeply troubled, and I began to worry about him. Billy walked back to the bed and sat on the floor next to his bong. I stepped in and felt a rush from the lingering smoke. I went to get a fan, opened a window, and set the fan to blow the smoke outside. Billy just sat there mumbling. Once I was done, I sat down next to him. I remember starting to speak firmly, Damn it, Billy, if Doug smells this when he gets home, he'll kick you out. Billy mumbled back, maybe that would be for the best. I saw such sadness in him, like he had given up. He sighed and said, Hell, it doesn't matter anyway. I'm dying. I was shocked and took a moment to respond. Oh Billy, do you have AIDS? He shook his head and said, Nah, I hate needles, but it's the other way of getting it. I am dying. His response was confusing, but he explained further. He said even with his lifestyle, he hadn't caught AIDS that way, but he was still suffering. He had been to a doctor, who told him it was the result of illegal substances use. I can't usually get it up, and when I do, I can't keep it up for long. I can barely scrape together enough money for my habit, so buying medication isn't likely. If I can't be much of a man, I might as well end it. So, getting thrown out by my brother really doesn't matter. We sat quietly for a few minutes. I felt ashamed for starting to think of ways to help that I knew Doug wouldn't approve of. Billy then looked at me with tears in his eyes and said, Doug's always been lucky because of you. You give him the strength to do what he needs to do. If it weren't for you, he'd be just as big a mess as I am. I blushed and turned my head so he couldn't see it. I didn't know how to respond, so I just sat there. The smoke in the room made everything feel hazy. If I could do it all over again, I would have left right then, but I didn't. Instead, I opened the door to the end of my marriage. I saw Billy as a broken person who didn't have a reason to live, and my heart broke for him. I reached out, put my arms around him, and hugged him. He put his head on my shoulder, and I gently stroked his hair. After a few minutes, he touched my cheek and then kissed me softly. Billy, I whispered, you shouldn't. Please, he begged softly, I've never kissed a good woman before. Please. I froze, unsure of what to do. I didn't kiss him back, but I didn't stop him either. He kissed me again and held me tight. His kisses grew more passionate, and his hands began to touch me under my shirt. When his hand moved lower, I flinched and whispered, Billy, please. He continued, saying he needed a reason to live. I was caught between shock and confusion. I didn't fight back or stop him as I should have. Instead, I sat there, torn between what I should do and the reality of the situation. Eventually, Billy became overwhelmed and pushed me back. The moment felt confusing and unsettling, and he quickly grew frustrated, unable to continue. He sat back, visibly distressed, tears welling up in his eyes. I realized that even though I hadn't fully consented, I hadn't stopped him either, and the weight of that reality settled in. Wanting to offer some comfort, I gently said, Come here. I took his hand and guided him to the bed, trying to soothe his obvious turmoil. He lay there quietly, and I attempted to console him, hoping to ease the tension between us. As I sat beside him, I felt the weight of the situation, this wasn't the closeness or tenderness I had shared with Doug. What was happening now lacked the affection and love that had always been at the heart of my marriage. Doug had always said that the connection between us, the way I expressed my love, made everything better for him. That love had fueled our intimacy, making every moment between us meaningful. 
But with Billy, it was different. There was no emotional connection, just the attempt to find comfort in the midst of confusion. As I continued to navigate the situation, my thoughts drifted to Doug. No matter what happened now, nothing could replace the love we shared. This moment wasn't about passion or intimacy, it was a response to Billy's pain. And in the end, I was left with a sense of regret and the knowledge that nothing could undo what had just taken place. Afterward, I lay there, breathing heavily, while Billy whispered his thanks. I felt a deep sense of accomplishment, having given hope to someone in despair. But as I stood up and looked at the situation, the reality of my actions hit me hard. I quickly gathered my clothes and headed for the door. Billy called out to me, and through my tears, I told him, never again. This can't happen again. Doug can't ever know. Do you understand? Billy nodded and lay back on the bed, covering his face with his arms. I think I heard him start to cry. I took another shower, trying to cleanse myself both physically and emotionally, but I couldn't shake the guilt. I hadn't intended to cheat on Doug, but that's how he would see it, and knowing it was with his brother made it even worse. I cried myself to sleep that night, knowing that things had changed forever. The next morning, Doug was furious when he noticed the lingering smell of pot. He almost threw Billy out immediately. Despite everything, Billy moved out three weeks later. Two weeks after his departure, I discovered I was pregnant. Doug and I were thrilled, and I convinced myself the baby was his. We had been very active since we got married, so it seemed likely. However, when Billy asked if he could be the father, I began to worry. I was angry and embarrassed to learn that Billy had confessed to Tom and Paula. They were not pleased but decided to keep our secret. We hoped Doug would never find out. I prayed every night that the child was Doug's and that Doug would never learn the truth. When the doctor revealed there was a potential problem with the baby, I felt a deep sense of dread. The defect could be corrected with surgery, but if it was severe, surgery might be required right after birth. The doctor mentioned that such defects could be linked to illegal substances abuse. When Doug was asked about illegal substances use, he expressed concern, but the doctor assured him that there were many uncertainties regarding birth defects. Despite this, I knew that the seed of doubt had been planted. Over the next few months, I tried to reassure Doug that the baby was his without revealing there was a chance it might not be. Although Doug never directly asked, I clung to a glimmer of hope that the baby was his. After the baby was born, everything fell apart. Doug got a DNA test and discovered that Billy was the father. He threw my belongings out of the house that day. Unsurprisingly, my parents disowned me, and I ended up moving in with Doug's parents. Doug wouldn't speak to me for two weeks. He finally agreed to meet with me after his parents persistently urged him to do so. Our conversation was largely one-sided. I had to make him understand how sorry I was and how much I needed him. I pleaded, begged, and cried, trying every possible way to get Doug to listen. I would have done anything to make him see how much he meant to me. Despite my efforts, Doug remained unmoved. All he could say was, you slept with my brother and had his child. Over the following week, his parents and I tried everything to get him to talk with us, hoping to find a way to work through the situation. Billy even wrote him a letter to explain and apologize. I could see the toll this was taking on Doug, his anger and frustration were evident in his eyes. I repeatedly called him and visited his workplace, which might have seemed like stalking, but I was determined to fight for my marriage. When Doug finally spoke with me, it was a harsh confrontation. He used hurtful words and even removed my wedding ring while I sat there, devastated. Up until that point, I had never felt threatened by Doug's rage, but now, facing it directly, I was terrified. Tom and Paula eventually advised me to stop pursuing Doug, as his anger was affecting them too. When Doug moved to Alabama, I began to imagine life without him, which felt bleak and devoid of hope. Overwhelmed by despair, I attempted to end my life, mixing sleeping pills with alcohol. I was found in time and taken to the hospital, where I was placed on suicide watch. After my release, 
Doug's son, whom we had named Doug Jr., went to live with Tom and Paula. I wasn't allowed to see him much, but that didn't bother me as much as it might have, since the baby was a painful reminder of the loss of my husband. I tracked Doug down in Alabama after my hospital stay and moved to a nearby trailer park. I got a job at a local beauty parlor and tried to establish a routine of working, calling Doug and visiting him. Doug eventually filed a restraining order against me, which forced me to adjust my routine. Despite this, I continued trying to reach out to him. It was clear that if I stopped trying, I would lose him completely. Around this time, Doug's divorce was finalized, likely influenced by the revelation about the baby being Billy's. Several months later, Doug moved again, this time to Texas. It took me eight months to find him. When I did, I relocated to be near him, focusing on a new job at a salon and not pressuring him as I had before. I met some of Doug's colleagues and shared highlights of our relationship, emphasizing my desire to reconcile without revealing everything. It took time, but Martha, one of Doug's acquaintances, noticed my genuine remorse and love for Doug. She saw how unhappy Doug was, and though he initially said he wasn't interested in talking to me, we all knew it was only a matter of time. That time came at his party, where Martha and I had planned a reconciliation. However, things went wrong. Doug told everyone his version of our story, which was harsh and condensed. I didn't dare interrupt him. I could see the frustration in his eyes as he spoke. After he was done, I begged him to come home with me, but he told me to go kill myself. At that moment, I knew I had lost him for good. After the party, I fell apart. Martha helped me get to a hospital, and a few days later, I found myself in an Atlanta hospital under suicide watch. You might be wondering about the baby. I'm told it's doing well. I haven't seen it since right before my first breakdown. Tom and Paula are taking care of the baby now, and they'll likely end up adopting it because, frankly, I'm not a fit mother. What else would you call a woman who can't bear to look at her own child? I know it sounds terrible, but every time I see the baby, I'm reminded of my mistake and all it cost me. It's not the baby's fault, I know, but that doesn't change anything. Does that make me a terrible person? Yes, in my eyes it does. I guess the doctors were right, this situation has helped me discover who I am, though what I found makes me sick. I'm a terrible wife and mother who lost her only reason to live. I'll probably have to hide this recording or they'll never let me out of here. They say they want honesty, but when you're honest, it scares them. I hope someday I'll find a way to cope with this, and I pray it happens soon. Meanwhile, Doug, I stood on a California beach looking out over the Pacific, finally feeling the end of the nightmare I'd lived through over the past few years. The resolution had actually started several weeks after the party when I received a text from my cousin in Georgia saying Teresa had killed herself. I was numb. It felt like waiting for the Titanic to sink, hoping against hope that somehow things would work out, but knowing they couldn't. I still loved her, but I could never have gone back to her. My path was clear. I wrote two short notes, enclosed them with a small black jewelry box, and sent them certified mail to my parents. The first note was addressed to them, explaining that since Teresa had taken the easy way out, it was up to me to look after my nephew's future. I mentioned that they would be able to take care of him financially now that Billy and I were out of the picture. I ended by wishing them better luck raising my nephew than they had raising Billy and me. The small black box was addressed to my brother. Inside were four items, the smashed remains of Teresa and my wedding rings, a single 9mm bullet, and a note that simply said run. It took me a few weeks to catch up to him. I finally found him in a crack house in Atlanta, living with some of his junkie friends. I remembered his face when I put my Glock between his eyes. The smell of his room didn't compare to the stench of his own despair. He begged me to kill him, saying he couldn't live with the guilt. Some would call it weakness, others might call it strength, but I couldn't pull the trigger. I took a bullet out of my clip and tossed it to him. Do it yourself, you piece of garbage. You're not going to ruin any more of my life. Go ruin someone else's. 
That was the last time I saw him, lying there crying in his own filth. I left Georgia that night, knowing I had burned all my bridges there and would never go back. That was a couple of weeks ago. I received a text this morning saying they had found Billy's body. He died from an overdose, and they found a 9mm bullet clutched in his hand. Looking out over the vast ocean, with no boats or ships in sight, I felt a loneliness that matched the emptiness in my heart. How do you live without your soulmate? I was about to find out. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.